we have a lot of uh, uh, skeletons, but nobody wants to bring them out of the closet. I never forget what they did. They stole my job, they stole my livelihood, they stole everything from me. They call it progress, but I call it destroying a country. This country betrayed a lot of people. And I just happened to be in the group, that's all. This is the Burrard Dry Dock in North Vancouver. It is a ghostly reminder of a bygone era. It was once a thriving shipyard that produced dozens of merchant ships. During World War II, Canada owned the fourth largest merchant fleet in the world and was poised to become one of the world's great maritime powers. All that is left of this once proud fleet is the mutilated end of a merchant ship in this abandoned shipyard. Although Canada is surrounded by three oceans, there is not a single deep sea ship flying the Canadian flag today. This is the story of what happened to our merchant fleet and the men who sailed the ships. I wanted to be a seaman. I don't know why. I heard about Hitler and I figured about Here's my chance. So I signed on as a galley boy, and if he would have came near me, I'd have thrown a potato at him. I was armed with a paring knife, ready for war. I was 16, just shy of 17, when I first went to sea. I went because I couldn't uh, stay in the army, which I joined and was thrown out because I was underage, because the war against fascism was on. Uh, my friends who were older were off to war. My brother was in the army. And uh, you just felt you had to be part of it at that time. You know, I was going to be conscripted eventually, and I had no real feeling for the Army or for the Air Force, and that's what I did. I joined the Merchant Navy. They didn't know I was only 16, so away we went. I ran into a friend from school that I hadn't seen for a long time. I asked him where he had been, and he said he just got back from uh, Murmansk. I said, that was in Russia, wasn't it? He said, yeah, it is. I said, how'd you get over there? He said, oh, I'm sailing on merchant ships. So I asked him how you go about sailing on merchant ships. And he told me to go up to the new post office building in Ottawa, see Captain Randall, the director of merchant seamen, and I'd be out in no time. One has to realize that they were often looked upon as the outcasts of society. That was the kind of job that uh, one did to escape reality, to turn to travel, whatever sort of thing. Real people really didn't want to do that job. I think the uppermost in my mind was gainful employment, uh, regardless of the fact that I never gave too much thought to the fact that uh, the war would have an effect on going to sea. Uh, you're kind of naive when you're 14, you know. But that uh, one trip across the Atlantic on a gasoline tanker changed my way of thinking forever. It may 
may be three weeks before they sight land. It may be six. It may be never. They have had ships cut from under them. They have been dragged from the hell of oil blazing on the sea. They see the horrors as well as the wonders of the deep. They don't get medals and they don't get prize money. They are the unofficial heroes of World War II. The whole North Atlantic was a suicide corridor. One convoy uh, with about 100 ships was sent north to the idea that it'd be safer going north because there's so many U-boats in the middle of the Atlantic. They got up there and the U-boats were waiting for them. I think it was only four ships survived the attacks there. Most of the time it was at night, oddly enough, the U-boats used to use to favor the night night attacks. But uh, usually all you'd see is a ball of flame, that's all, you know, you, and, and it's pretty difficult to relate it with a, with a ship. But uh, I, I think that the most graphic thing that occurred to me was when you're, uh, you're, you're, you're crossing the Atlantic and you're sailing through a previous convoy's uh, route, you know, and the wreckage that's still around, like floating lifeboats and uh, life jackets. And, oil, heavy, heavy patches of oil, you realize that the people that went before you had a rough time. Far away from land, in the open ocean, the young seamen faced not only the danger of war, but the harsh reality of life on the ships. The ships were terrible places to work. The, uh, the companies were run by Neanderthals uh, whose only thought was domination of the men because that's how they made the most money. Conditions on ships were 12 hours on, 12 hour, hours off, seven days a week for less than 100 bucks a month. The food was bad. And obviously, the, there were two different types of food served to the officers and, and to the crew. The captain on the ship had, had more authority than God in them days. They could arrest anybody. The guy feeling sick and didn't want to go down to the engine room, the old man could uh, put him ashore and say he was no good, he wasn't working. In each ship I sailed, I was outraged by the chief steward's conduct. They were constantly stealing our food and selling it illicitly to people on shore. But we all used to sleep up forward in the, in the forecastle. Everybody slept in there. We ate there and slept there in one room. The mattresses were straw. Honest to God, they were straw mattresses. The bathroom used to be a piece of plank, four or five feet long, sticking over the side. And you used to go to the bathroom in there, go out, go out, hold on to the rail. And... With the wages we were getting, we, they weren't supplied any clothing. We had to buy our own. So what we quite often did was uh, a few of the seamen would chip together, buy a good top coat, and then as one seaman was coming off watch, he'd give it to the other one to wear on his watch. The, the youngsters who came in found themselves really for the first time with a sense of identity, and their, their fellow crew members were their first real family. Founded during the Great Depression, the CSU was organized by seamen themselves in opposition to the company unions orchestrated by ship owners. The attempt to unionize met vicious antagonism on the part of the shipping companies. Uh, the most vocal was um, the, uh, on the Great Lakes was the Canada Steamship Lines, the Sarnian Colonial Companies, uh, Patterson Companies. Um, and these companies basically uh, formed a, a shipping company association to counter the union movement. This was a time when working people were fighting for recognition of unions and for the right to organize without being attacked by company gangsters and the police. The master used to be God Almighty at sea, but our contracts usually pointed out that if, if a, a guy is elected by the, uh, by the majority of the crew, that, that the master has to listen to him. It's in the contract, you know. When we got organized, we got the unions aboard, Things change. We got mattresses, good mattresses. We got water coolers. We got air f f refrigerators. We got everything. We never had none of that before. 
the union cared very much about its members and did everything they could in long, long negotiations, getting us better and better food. Every uh, cabin had uh, spring-filled mattresses, and they worked for those things without bringing on a strike that would, would in, impede the war effort. <laughs> Just so, all winter long, the ships have come and gone. Quietly and steadily into the Canadian harbors. Quietly and steadily out again. Yet they come over the horizon from danger. And when their smokestacks drop out of sight on the long voyage home, they know not where or when the terror will strike. For five years of a six-year war, these guys were doing a job that was far more hazardous in terms of loss of life and injury than that by the Navy or any of the military. 1,651 merchant seamen had lost their lives by the time the war was over. Survivors returned home, but unlike members of the armed forces, Seamen were greeted with no ceremony or fanfare. There was no recognition for them. There was no publicity of, of, of the, the job that they were doing. They were virtually the unsung heroes of the war. Because they were not officially part of the armed services, the Canadian government refused benefits to members of the Merchant Marine. These young men, who had become seamen because they wanted to contribute to Canada's war effort, were now left out in the cold. You couldn't get government grants, you couldn't get grant tuning, you couldn't go down to the uh, Veterans Affairs and ask to be sent to school to learn a trade because you weren't in, you weren't in the Army and in any of the services. We were not included. When the war was over, seamen expected an end to their long hours and a raise in pay. After all, they spent five years risking their lives on the high seas. The opposite happened. Contrary to what was promised, ship owners demanded that seamen continue working the 84-hour week with a 30% cut in wages. They were forced into a bitter strike. They were basically looking for uh, the simple process of improved working conditions, better wages, um, health care programs, this sort of thing. Shipping companies had made enormous profits during the war and owners now felt threatened by Siemens' demands. The strike that, that occurred in, in 1946 was a legal strike. That didn't stop the shipping companies from bringing in these scabs. It didn't stop the RCMP from assisting them. It didn't stop the uh, Canadian National Police from assisting the scabs. Um, there were police motorcades, motorcycle motorcades from Montreal, bringing scabs in, crossing picket lines. The same men who braved the cold waters of the Atlantic during World War II were now being attacked by the shipping companies and the police. For a group of people that served the country honorably, uh, I, I don't think they responded too well. It was a complete turnaround from the heroes and dungarees that they used to call us, and we used to be lauded and sung and everything else, you know. Support for the CSU was still strong amongst the general public. Memories of the war and the high death toll of merchant seamen were still fresh in people's minds. As tensions grew, the government ordered the shipping companies to comply with nationally accepted standards. The 1946 strike was won. Right about the eight hour day, it, it did away with the four on and stay on and no overtime and established the union as a credible union. We were encouraging other unions to stand up and fight. Wherever there were workers in trouble and we could help them, we did. It was a spark plug for the rest of the Canadian Union movement. Anytime there was a strike anywhere, if they asked for help, the Canadian Siemens Union would be there to help them. I know myself, I, I walked on picket lines for the textile mill where the women were on strike and scabs were crossing. I got arrested for it. They were very, very helpful to our union of textile workers when we had strikes 
they always came to help us and support us. They just fitted in with our people, and you didn't know who was a cotton mill worker and who was a seaman. The Canadian Seamen's Union was widely respected for its progressive policies. It was one of the first unions to publish a bilingual newspaper. The CSU organized schools for ships' delegates and was one of the first unions in Canada to obtain equal wages for non-white workers. CSU members often took part in the struggles of working people in many parts of the world. I was in Sri Lanka in 1948 and the uh, printing company there were on strike and uh, they asked us for support. So I got uh, quite a few of the seamen to go on the picket line with me and uh, they made up all the uh, placards, posters and everything. And we had quite a turnout, a big turnout of the public. This was, a, I mean, a shock to everybody because never before in our history had any foreign seamen or any foreign workers come and publicly solidarize with workers in our country in a struggle, and they happen to be white workers. The CSU success stuck in the craw of the Canadian government, of the business community. And when they had the opportunity to revert and correct the situation, they took advantage of it. That opportunity came with the start of the Cold War. Suddenly, communism was the new enemy. Communism is a creed, spreading unseen from mind to mind. Who could tell the extent of its invasion? But the question remained. If attack ever came, would it be from without or from within? The, the Cold War set the tone for the trade union movement entirely. It set the tone if you were in a red union or if you were not in a red union. If you were in a red union, you were attacked. If you were not in a red union, you were, uh, it was the manner that you can form and that you attack the reds. And that is what little I saw of thing that worked. Organized labor in North America grew dramatically during and after the war. The Canadian Seamen's Union was part of a movement of trailblazing unions like Mine, Mill and Smelter, United Electrical Workers, and the Canadian Textile Council, which were successful in getting better wages and working conditions. These unions were viewed as socialist by the conservative American unions based south of the border who controlled their Canadian affiliates. One side of the union world, you had the goon philosophy, the goon mentality. Let's club them, you know, and on, on the other side, Marxist. They really believed there would be more equality in the world. There were people that were communists, and some of the leaderships that were communists. But these people were more like nationalists. They, they, nobody was going to, going to sell the country out to Joe Stalin or something like that. They were, these people were looking and fighting for, for the rights of working people here in Canada. And this didn't pl play well with the ship owners. And they just joined on the bandwagon of the United States and branding whoever they didn't like or whoever spoke out as, as communists. It was, I'm telling you, I lived through that period and it was a scary time. It was an hysteria. And so every demand for justice, every criticism of injustice was met by that. Sometimes we forget that the options were limited. You did not have the kind of a uh, trade union movement that you have today. You did not have the kind of a political setup that you had today. And if you were a worker, you got help from who would help you. Not, uh, you didn't sit down and ponder the possible realities of life in the Soviet Union or any crap like that. They helped us, yes. They, they helped us raise funds for bail when we were in jail. They gave us shelter and homes. The communists did an honorable job. They did an outstanding job in developing the industrial unions First of all, we begin with the CIO, the CCL here, and developing the industrial unions and moving on to the CME. They did a fantastic job 
and at great personal sacrifice. For some on the left and in the labor movement, the pressure of anti-communist hysteria and witch hunting was taking its toll. In 1947, Pat Sullivan, president and founding member of the Canadian Seamen's Union, made a surprising about-face and publicly denounced the CSU as a subversive organization. It was a really sad day for us, because Pat Sullivan was one of the original organizers of the Canadian Seamen's Union on the Great Lakes in 1936. But it turned out he must have been an opportunist and just waiting for the payout. He was, he was for sale. He was beginning to be important and rising in the uh, atmosphere of labor, labor statesmen, so he thought. But he was telling the bosses that he was up for sale. That and, of course, many other things he did. They got the message. Pat Sullivan renounced his uh, communism and denounced the communists for having led the, uh, the CSU, said the CSU was nothing more than dictated by the communists, this sort of thing. It uh, fit perfectly with the McCarthyism of the United States and the anti-communism. Uh, to replace Sullivan, a 30-year-old Montrealer named Harry Davis was elected president of the CSU. Like all members of the Union Executive, Davis had served on the ships as an ordinary seaman. His experience proved crucial as the Union entered a battle for its very existence. On the one hand, the government decided that it was going to get rid of its uh, seagoing merchant ships, when in fact taxpayers had built a seagoing merchant navy for Canada. The American ship owners and others, and even the ship owners here, did not want Canada to have uh, an international seafaring merchant navy. So that the government went after the Canadian Seamen's Union. The only way they could destroy their seafaring merchant navy was over the dead body of the Canadian Seamen's Union because those men protected those jobs. And that's when the real war began against the Canadian Seamen's Union. In an unprecedented move, the American Seafarers International Union, the SIU, was called in from across the border. I believe that the SIU came in because Canada Steamship Lines, uh, along with uh, representatives of the Canadian government, and in particular, I think, C.D. Howe, felt it was appropriate uh, to replace the, the CSU. The Liberal cabinet arranged to bring in a mobster from the United States, Hal Banks, a real hardcore gangster. And he brought in his Seafarers International Union, and they introduced it into our ships with bicycle chains and uh, baseball bats. This was not just a amateurish project of bringing in Hal Banks to defeat the CSU in 1949. As Hal Banks admitted himself, they had expert PR people, expert media people, they had uh, uh, the support of the government, of the business community. They also had the unimportant element, which was the Banks's quote, broad-shouldered boys, who came in and just beat the hell out of the strikers. They controlled the union through fear. He had a big white Cadillac he used to drive up. Drive up to the hall and park a big white Cadillac. You know, just, he was the boss, he was the man. And here was a guy who wasn't supposed to be allowed to enter Canada because what he'd done in the United States kicked a man to death, convicted and charged with a lot of crimes in the United States. But he was brought in here to do a job, to break the union. In addition to attempts by the SIU to take over ships organized by the Canadian Seamen's Union, 
the government recommended a new contract that would allow ship owners to hire non-union workers and foreign seamen. The union fought back. It was an inevitable strike. It was a strike that, that uh, we could not have avoided. It was, it was uh, forced on us. We had the attitude there as, as a group that we'd rather be uh, dead on our feet than alive on our bloody knees again, you know. So we weren't tolerating the rollbacks. In March 1949, the CSU struck the Lady Rodney, owned by Canadian National Steamship Lines, the first company to sign an agreement with the SIU. In the early hours of April 8th, trainloads of scabs, escorted by RCMP, arrived from Montreal to break through CSU picket lines and board the ship. They shunted them in, and the wharf, the, the sheds are level with the boxcars. So they open the doors towards the shed, they open the ones towards the waterfront, and they operate on the, on load them right by the gangplank. And they run it all down it and all up the gangplank. All held with gunfire, bottles thrown, Hoses that they had on the ship hooked up to uh, give it a so they couldn't get up the gangway. So then they pull out the, the trains, and then the doors were open. They're just blasted with fire hose in the in the cold middle winter. One of the men on board started firing live ammunition with a shotgun at uh, the strikers who were on shore. I mean, all hell broke loose. There were eight guys who were hit. After that morning, I said, well, they're not going to stop at anything. The Lady Rodney incident marked the beginning of similar confrontations all over the country. Ship owners on both coasts began signing contracts with the American Union. Police and SIU scabs, armed with hardwood axe handles and baseball bats, attacked CSU crews and boarded the ships. We went to St. John's to reinforce the picket line, and all of a sudden we look over and we see this, all these big trucks backing up to the picket line. Fowler moving in transport, St. John to Brunswick. All of a sudden, back of the trucks open up. Holy mackerel, I'd jump about 200 mounted police, all dressed in battle dress with steel helmets and clubs. And the officers had these uh, leather things about two feet long. They have lead in the tips, so when they whack you on the head, they really kind of break bone. These guys came for battle. They just came and they just jumped out and, and just smashed the hell out of everybody. You had vicious brutality. You ended up with strikers being thrown in jail for not just a couple of days, but getting uh, sentences of a couple of years and, and massive fines. Scabs? Simply released. Uh, we, we, we knew uh, not too long after we were, you know, after a few months into the strike that... Uh, the handwriting was on the wall, you know. This, this, is, this is a little more than a strike for better conditions, you know. You could feel it in the air, it was almost electric, you know. The dispute spread around the world as hundreds of unions took action to support the Canadians. Dock workers, tugboat operators, and railway workers in 26 countries refused to unload the struck Canadian ships. 60% of worldwide shipping was affected. In New Zealand, the 27-man crew of the Tridale were arrested for mutiny under the Admiralty Act and given two months of hard labor. Gunboats opened fire on CSUers in Cuba. Three were murdered in San Francisco. Dock workers in Cape Town, South Africa, refused to work the struck Canadian ships. In Brisbane, Australia, the Triberg was manned by scabs flown in from Montreal. In Melbourne, the Haligonian Duke was declared a black ship. An Australian longshoreman refused to touch it. After several months, the Australian government brought in the Navy. But nowhere did the strike receive more support than in Great Britain. 30 food ships and 70 other vessels lie idle in London docks. The Canadian ship Beaver Bray, which dockers refuse to unload due to a wage dispute between its Canadian crew and the owners, is cause of the trouble that now involves more than 8,000 men. Condemning the men's claim that the stoppage is a lockout engineered by the employers, cabinet ministers brand the strike as a communist maneuver. Vital exports are held up while the dockers hold the country to ransom. We weren't opposed to the dockers working on those other ships and unloading that cargo. We were just asking that they not work the 
the Beaver Break. We marched from, uh, I don't know, March started in the East End of London, and we marched up to Trafalgar Square, and uh, they had the music there. They played the 12th Street Rag, and the headlines came out in the paper. The next day, the Canadian seamen were marching to the red flag. In Trafalgar Square, their leaders speak. First is Harry Van Loo, Doc's committee member and Labour councillor, who says he is not a communist. From the two so-called black ships, Beaver Bray and Argamont, are Canadian seamen. For the Canadian speaks Bud Doucet, another self-stated non-communist. All this talk while ships lie idle in the docks. More troops are called in to speed the unloading of food ships. Navy, Army and eventually Air Force men safeguard the nation's larder. Not since the general strike has Britain faced a graver hour at home. We had a we had the printing of the whole world tied up for a while then, but it didn't last. What was to become the biggest international strike of the 20th century tied up major ports around the world and cost ship owners significant profits. In Canada, the unrelenting anti-communist campaign was turning public opinion against the CSU. The press was totally, totally biased. They never came to the picket line, never came to the union hall and say, hey guys, how does it feel to be suffering from malnutrition, have scabs all over your body and you haven't shaved in a, or showered in a, in, in, in a month? Eh? And how does it feel to be sleeping on a, in a flop house on St. Lawrence, Maine or under a bench in the union hall? We never heard nothing about that. Every criticism of the government was countered by he's or she's a communist. And so there was no argument because you were a communist. It was an hysteria. They just went with Senator Joe McCarthy all the way. It was a pivotal moment in Canadian trade union history. Pressure was mounting on the Trades and Labor Congress of Canada to expel the CSU. When the Congress continued to defend the union, the American ambassador, Lawrence Steinhardt, telephoned Percy Ben Goff, president of the Congress, and demanded the expulsion of the Canadian Seamen's Union. The general trade union movement, very fearful of being tarred with the same brush, lost track of the justice of the justification of the demands of the left-wing unions or of the validity of the kind of struggles which they were carrying through, which were on behalf of the on behalf of the workers. And under the pressure of the political division, moved totally over to the government side and consequently over to the to the shipowner side, to the boss's side, and isolated the union. Well, the labor labor movement uh, cooperated with it, the government cooperated with it, and the owners cooperated with it. And uh, when you have evil, it has so much help, it's not going to stop very fast. When you get the whole trade union moving, siding in with a company, and the government siding in with a company, you're dead. Under tremendous pressure, the Canadian Trades and Labour Congress expelled the Canadian Seamen's Union on June 1st, 1949. It was a way of going backwards and trying to take away the gains we had made as the result of organization during and after the war. And it did a lot of harm. A merchant seaman who was painted and tarred with the brush of communism uh, through no fault of his own, not only is he ostracized from a, a ship at sea, he's ostracized from a job ashore. And he's got no training for a job ashore. Because you have to remember, most of these people were kids, teenagers. The average age on a lot of the ships, 19 years old. You couldn't defend yourself. What were you going to defend? You weren't getting the jobs. You weren't getting the money. And if, if they found out you were a, a seaman of some kind you were involved in, they didn't want to hire you. I think that the Canadian Seamen's Union in some ways was used as an example. Um, the Canadian Seamen's Union uh, was, was, was thrown out of every house of labor that existed. And once they were thrown out of the house of labor, then that meant that they were open game for raiding. 
and uh, they were just raided to death, essentially. Shut down, kicked off, raided. Many of the seamen never recovered from the destruction of their union. For these men, the loss of their jobs meant the loss of their identity. These guys sailed during the war. They were made all kinds of promises. They were going to do this for the seamen, that for the seamen. There was more merchant seamen killed during the war than sailors in the, in, you know, the Navy here. When you, you survive a bloody thing like that, World War II, and then you, re, you, you, you start asking yourself, was I looking in the right di direction for the enemy when I should have been looking behind me, you know? It, it gives you that kind of disillusionment, and some people can't stand up under the pressure, you know? It's, some went to Toronto, some went to Vancouver, some went out west and all over the place. Some of them end up dying on boxcars, some of them end up rubby dubs and dying on the streets. A lot of them. Cody McMillan, Sandy McDonald, Johnny Baldwin, couldn't get good work, couldn't get good jobs, so they, they ended up sitting around the park bench with, with wine and stuff, and they ended up falling apart. Uh, it's 50 years now, I still feel angry. I still feel the same. I still feel the same as I did in those days. I never forget what they did. They stole my job, they stole my livelihood, they stole everything from me. I, in the strike of 1949, I was 19 years old. I spent a quarter of my life I spent at sea. They took this all away from me. They just burst us, just threw us out like garbage. George Fraser sailed on the very last CSU ship between Halifax and Montreal. When Hal Banks' SIU came on board, he was faced with a tough decision. This to me was one of the saddest things that ever happened in my life. I had, I had two choices. I could sign up with the SIU or just never sail again. I put 20,000 hours on the, on the wheel and 20,000 hours on lookout. I could splice wire, I could do anything. I could paint, I could do anything on a ship. But where else could I work? Hal Banks' blacklist banned thousands of experienced seamen from ever working on Canadian ships again. Those that did sail were forced to prove they were not part of a subversive organization. We had carried a screening card in your back pocket or you didn't ship. It involved your whole life story from the day you were born, every school you went to, you know, where your father came from, what his politics were, what everything was. They had all this data on you and they fingerprinted us and all this stuff was illegal but they still went ahead and did it. Now that the CSU was gone and the SIU was in place, there was little to stop the government from selling off the Canadian merchant fleet. The Canadian government uh, stated that they were getting under, out of uh, the merchant uh, service uh, and the merchant navy. The Prime Minister uh, Saint Laurent said we, we can't afford it. The Americans could afford it, the Brits could afford it, but Canada didn't want to afford it. In spite of strong public sentiment in favor of maintaining the merchant service and the shipbuilding industry, the Canadian fleet was sold. Long before the term privatization was coined, one of the largest sales in Canadian history of a publicly owned asset had taken place. That's why they wanted to break the CSU, to get rid of the ships. You know, they used the communist scare in those days. They said, we got to get rid of those guys because they're all commies and, and, and we're, uh, we're concerned about, about uh, Canadian ships. The fact of the matter is, as soon as they broke the union is when the employers had a free hand to dump the ships, to put them all under foreign registries. Some of the ships were sold to Great Britain, many to Greece but the majority went to the Great Lakes shipping companies on condition that they reinvest in Canadian deep sea shipping, a condition never fulfilled. Ironically enough, they were selling those ships for, for a song. We were still paying for them 20, 25 years after the war, still paying for them, and they were sold at bargain basement prices already. You know? The government's intention uh, to get rid of the, uh, the merchant navy worked very, very effectively. Within a decade, there was no Canadian Merchant uh, Navy. It was the end of the Canadian Merchant Fleet. The opportunity to have our own ships and shipbuilding industry had been destroyed. Runaway ship owners started hiring foreign crews at much lower wages. 
and registering their vessels offshore. Instead of Canadian flagships carrying our goods around the world, we became dependent on other countries in a new global practice called Flags of Convenience. Flag of Convenience is, is a, a nationality that a ship owner will choose to attach to his ship other than his own nationality. You can basically fax off the details of your ship to the uh, shipping maritime department of that particular country, like Panama, the largest flag of convenience country, and uh, submit your tonnage tax, uh, which is a, a very, very small amount of money. That money goes into the coffers of that government. They don't uh, ask, ask anything more or make any requirements upon the ship owner. Uh, he can hoist that flag and uh, sail under the laws of, uh, of Panama and, uh, and basically be home free. The ship owner can save himself up to $700,000 on an average sized ship. That's 700000 US dollars per year by operating in, in a substandard manner. Not replacing steel on the deck that's totally corroded through or frames that have come away from the hull of the ship. Not fixing and welding those so that they're strong again knowing full well that this ship is in this condition. He'll send it out with a cargo because he can afford to. He's saving $700,000 a year. Below, a frightful sight. The gigantic bow of the flare is drifting away. Four seamen miraculously survive by hanging desperately to an overturned lifeboat. 15 bodies are recovered and six crew members are missing, most of them Filipinos. This steel ghost wandered for four days on the ocean, a symbol of a shameful secret of the international world of maritime transportation. In the last decade, more than a hundred ball carriers have sunk, claiming almost 700 lives. Uh, that vessel was, uh, was detained and found deficient in Montreal the year before. Um, it was still deficient after it left Montreal, I'm sure, and it became more and more deficient throughout that, that course of time. And uh, I think there were six survivors, 23 lost. The conditions that uh, we achieved in those uh, wartime years were far better than any ship you'll find certainly under foreign registry today. Oh, Michael, they're disgusting. I've seen ships lying off English Bay in Vancouver, absolutely rust buckets. It's pathetic that what the unscrupulous conduct of ship owners in our time is, it, it's, it's beyond scandalous. The vast majority of ships coming and going from Vancouver's harbor are flying flags of convenience. This is the fastest growing sector of world shipping today. Although flag of convenience ships represent only 25% of the world's fleet, they carry more than half of the world's cargoes. One of those ships is the Atlantis II, abandoned by its owners in Vancouver's harbor. It is in such bad shape, port authorities refuse to let it sail. For months, the unpaid crew have been living on the dilapidated ship with their supplies and water running out. We want uh, our money and we want our tickets to go home. That's all we need. They are facing a long legal battle and uncertainty as to how they are ever going to get back home. All Canadian deep-sea shipping companies fly flags of convenience. Canada Steamship Lines International operates a fleet of bulk carriers under foreign registry. The company is solely owned by the family of former finance minister and later prime minister, Paul Martin. Paul Martin is a Canadian citizen and he has a Canadian uh, operating base company called Canada Steamship Lines 
and uh, all of his internationally trading vessels are flying the flags of Liberia, Bermuda, Bahamas, and those sorts of things. The reason Mr. Martin chooses to do that is so that one, he doesn't have to pay Canadian taxes on his worldwide assets or earnings. Two, he doesn't have to employ any Canadians on his vessels. He can put uh, Indians or Filipinos or Ukrainians or whatever he likes on there. Three, he's not regulated by any Canadian social or safety standards. And four, he's not regulated by Canadian structural standards for the safety of the ship, its actual structural integrity. Ironically, Canada Steamship Lines, the same company that was actively involved in breaking the Canadian Seamen's Union in 1949, is still involved in anti-union activities today. As the CSL Yarra makes its way along the Australian coast, bound for Adelaide, the atmosphere on board is less than buoyant. The ship's owner, CSL, is about to sell the Yarra to an Asian subsidiary, re-register it in the Bahamas, and replace its 17 Australian crew with 25 Ukrainians. As a result, CSL will save around $2 million a year in wages and costs, and what's more, the company will avoid paying taxes. But the ship will still carry the same Australian cargo around the same route from Adelaide to Melbourne and Brisbane. They um, didn't take the ship away to change the flag to a third world country. They determined they were so cocky and confident uh, they determined they would do it in an Australian port. Uh, they took the ship to a, 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 a small port called Port Piri and um, re-registered it in the Bahamas and we're in the process of flying in a Ukrainian crew. The Port Piri standoff became front page news. Australians rallied around the crew and opposed the incursion of foreign flag vessels into Australian waters. All we want is our right to man our ships. While a strong police presence prevented these demonstrators from getting onto the wharf, four others managed to chain themselves to the berth hours earlier. They're incensed at CSL Australia's decision to reflag the CSL Yarra, rename it and replace its Australian crew with foreigners. Ironically, when the crew refused to leave the vessel and fought for their jobs, um, their families, working men and women, refused that Mr Martin's company then uh, took those individuals to Australian and the Australian Supreme Court to sue them for contempt. If this ship uh, is handed over to foreign seafarers, then uh, where are they going to go? Because the next ship on the Australian coast may be handed over to foreign seafarers and in the end there'll be no jobs for, for anyone. Um, they sat aboard that vessel for 21 days. Uh, Canadian steamship line turned off the electricity, uh, removed all sewerage connections. Uh, there was no food aboard, turned off the water connections, and basically developed the strategy of starving them out in this small port out in the Australian outback. Port Piri Mayor Ken Madigan's ensuring the welfare of the crew, today delivering 50 loads of bread and 40 litres of milk. After weeks of dispute, CSL re-registered the ship in the Bahamas and sailed with a Ukrainian crew. The Australian crew members of the Yara were left without jobs. Effectively, what Canadian uh, steamship lines are doing in Australia is opening up the market to the introduction of guest labour, uh, developing country standards of employment, uh, taxation avoidance, Australian regulatory avoidance in a systematic and strategic and objective way. I mean, you really are talking about a shipping company that is a bottom feeder here, that is working at the worst end of corporate governance and com company ethics. Maybe Mr Martin doesn't know about it. You make your own mind up. Is that a 
break the mold of conventional wisdom. We're gonna, we're gonna shrug off the old assumptions, and we're basically gonna chart a new course. We are going to lay the foundation. I want a government that is eager to change, a government that is prepared to turn the page so that we can make history. Thank you. Yeah. Well, well yeah, I, you'll have to talk to the company, but my understanding from what I've read in the papers, in fact, what they've been doing is simply following the law as established by the Australian government. Well, are you still taking yeah. orders to court in Australia? Sorry, we have people there clear. Step back. Mr. Martin's having a ship built in China right now. He's, he's building a ship with a, with a German company. It's a joint venture. Uh, the, company is, the German company is called Oldendorf. And uh, they're, they're one of our, our major pariahs in the world. They're uh, absolutely maddening in terms of uh, trying to deal with uh, issues of their workers when, their issues, when their workers are being mistreated. Mr. Martin's a business partner with, uh, with Mr. Oldendorf. I think his name is Egon. And he's building a ship in Dalin, China. What's going on here? This man could be our prime minister. I think that there's a problem with that, and, uh, and it's time that uh, people start uh, waking up to these, these issues. I, think the, I don't think the Canadian Siemens Union would have let that opportunity pass. We're out here walking instead of working, because we're protesting tax evasion by the rich. We're only starting to let Paul Barton there's one thing about Paul Martin. Paul Martin's going to tell each and every one of us uh, Canadians that you people have got to understand we're trying to make this country work and you've got to do your fair share. What Paul Martin can do to help to make this country work is bring those ships back and put Canadians on them. They promised in wartime they were going to save the merchant fleet. Canada would have a merchant fleet. The Canadian merchant seamen were going to have jobs after the war because they were going to ma maintain the merchant fleet. It's completely ludicrous. If you'd say today, here we are with three ocean fronts, and Canada is a big exporting country, how many ships do we have in Canada now? How many deep sea ships flying the Canadian flag? None. I think Canadians paid the price because we are a nation that is sea to sea. It's bordered by water uh, on all three sides of it. And uh, it's rather a curious anomaly not to have our own merchant uh, service. The shipbuilding industry has never recovered from the sell-off of the Canadian merchant fleet. Tens of thousands of jobs were lost, and a vital part of the Canadian economy was dismantled. Fifty years ago, the Canadian Siemens Union challenged the global shipping industry as no one has done before or since. The CSU's success in bettering the lives of merchant seamen remains a remarkable achievement. You'll never see it again, not in my time. Or, and I don't think anybody else ever see a, a union like that. They come up from nothing and really made something, and really brought the ships right out, brought them right up to standard. With the track record that that union had, why in the world it would ever be destroyed, I mean, arranged to be destroyed by the government and the goons that they brought into Canada. I could never forgive it, but I think it's important that we know that so that people, you know, if, if this a, a kind of situation ever comes again, we can get the public involved in stopping such a destructive uh, act. <laughs>